do cuttlefish wear their thoughts on their skin? I mean, to the extent that their perception of the, of the world could be described as their thought, yeah, that's true. They look at you in a way that other animals don't look at you. They're just so expressive. There was a possibility of using a trick to indirectly uh, sample a very large number of neurons by proxy, basically. A human has uh, about 200 different ways we can use our muscles to move. With this kit, we can record in an adult cuttlefish uh, probably millions. Cuttlefish, they've solved the problems, their solution is there. There's stuff to be learned just by understanding them. So cuttlefish are, are cephalopods um, and they actually invented this method of hiding which um, involved the hijacking of a part of their musculature uh, into an organ in their skin to generate a controllable display. And the amazing thing about this controllable display is that it's controlled by the nervous system meaning that they can change their external appearance extremely fast. Within a couple of hundred milliseconds, they can completely change their external appearance. You see behind the house of a snail, there is one. There is always this little animal sitting here. I should find a name, Johnny or so. And uh, a bigger one. Uh, likes to, to hide under this rock there in the corner. The way in which the system is organized um, is such that the output of the system is a set of, of pixels. Those are little bags of pigments that are controlled by a radial set of muscles. And so the diameter of this pixel is controlled by the rate and amount of contraction of these muscles, which itself is under the control of up to three motor neurons. Those motor neurons themselves are located in the brain of the animal, but they're the last layer of the output of the system. So they represent the output of this complex computational system that does a matching between an image that the animal sees and what it produces on its skin. There it goes. So these cameras uh, are zoomed in on small patches of this animal's skin, uh, overlapping so we, we tile the entire body. In the skin, there's thousands of specialized pigment cells called chromatophores. And each chromatophore receives direct input from motor neurons projecting from the brain. So these cameras are picking up the expansion and contraction of these pigment cells and then use this to infer the activity of motor neurons and use that to infer the activity of premotor neurons and sort of walk deeper into the brain. When we systems neuroscientists try and figure out what the neural correlates of perception are, we have to design very complicated experiments, behavioral experiments, usually involving learning, uh, of which the results have to be relatively simple. Do you recognize this or do you not recognize this? Can you do a simple discrimination task? In this case, you have a behavioral description of the output which is complete. The animal on its skin tells you its perception of the external world. Indeed, what we're seeing is the output of the system and we know the input as well. We control the, the visual inputs coming in. We have this really high resolution behavioral measurement and we want to infer something about the black box that is the cuttlefish brain uh, with this input-output mapping. Because that's the, that's the big goal here. Cuttlefish as cephalopods are doing an operation which we as humans, engineers, uh, computer scientists find extremely difficult to do. What are the features that one needs to extract so as to reproduce something that will fool another animal? Okay. In the attempts that uh, machine vision people have had to train networks to do that very simple matching, you need hundreds of thousands of training trials. 
And the fascinating thing about these animals is that they're born with the ability to immediately do a camouflage that's effective, which implies that in their brain they have the solution to this problem and that if that solution is encoded in their nervous system and in their genes, it must be a relatively simple solution. So that's what we're getting at, or what we're trying to get at. I think if we want to learn what is really fundamental about how brains work in general, we'd want to compare across the most different examples as possible. Uh, our common ancestor was a small marine worm that lived about 600 million years ago that had most likely a, a very, very simple nervous system. So it's all independent. So if we find some common features about how brains work or how behavior works in these animals and how it works in vertebrates like ourselves, we can really say that we can, we've learned something fundamental about how these things work in general. We can't really say that if we only study one sort of evolutionary instantiation. You want to study it because it's so different, not in spite of it. Yeah.